is an extreme honor today that Dr. Sheldon Lerner, who's the uh, co-founder of Blue Sky Bio Implants, accepted my request to do a podcast, and I um, I was begging him to do this because somebody started a thread about Blue Sky um, Bio uh, Implant Surgical Guides, and I mean, the thread, uh, in all reality, it went viral. I mean, there's like 10,000 views on this thing, so basically in the... Um, since I've been out of school since 87, you know, at first the big hot spot was, you know, the intro camera and then it was tooth whitening and, and uh, then we had the cosmetic revolution. But you are sitting right in the middle of the tsunami hot spot of dentistry where there's a lot of convergence of things going on. We've gone from a 2D x-ray machines to 3D and then so now implant surgery that it's been really a game changer for implant surgery or basically oral surgery in general, because you're thinking about pulling a wisdom tooth and you see that lingual nerve, but you don't really know where it is. But with 3D, you know exactly where it is. And it's usually a lot more lingual than you think. And uh, so how do, so, so first of all, um, have you seen that thread? And what, what do you think about that thread? Of course I've seen the thread. I'm on it. First of all, Howard, thank you for inviting me. It's an honor. And a lot of what we do is all your fault. <laughs> My wife screams at me, what are you looking at? <laughs> and I said, I'm on Dental Town. Here, see? There's no pictures of anything bad here. She goes, oh, look at those bloody things. Anyway, so like, like a lot of people, um, Dental Town has replaced television viewing for me. And um, a lot of what we do is essentially your fault. And I, I've given her your home address. <laughs> and I said she can call you, come to your house, complain to you. The, the digital convergence is happening on Dental Town. There's something called crowdsourcing. You've probably heard the term. I don't know if everybody on Dental Town has heard the term. I live in two or three worlds. One of the worlds is in dentistry, and the other world's on the digital side. And somewhere in the middle um, are these young guys that I got to talk to and talk to them in their lingo. It's a whole different life. You know, the guys who, who are supposedly working, but they're, they're um, using guide wires to like fly themselves from across from one room to the other. It's like a nursery school. It's basically our digital, a digital group, which is all young guys. They speak a different language. Crowdsourcing means, in essence, that instead of, of trying to guess what your consumer or customer, or in this case, clinician wants, make them part of the research team and have them decide what would be better, what could we do, and so on and so forth. So essentially, that 10,000 thread 10,000 view more, it's close to 11 or 12, I don't know how many by now, on Dental Town is the world's first crowdsourced digital resource for us to develop a very responsive um, program for gu uh, implant guide planning. Essentially what we do is we listen to everything that's said on that, on that uh, wire to your guys who are on there and say, I'd like to have this. Well, we tell our, our development team who we've never never unravel them. The same development team that was there in the beginning is there now. We say, okay, this is the latest out of Dental Town. They want this. Two weeks later, it's in a build. Sometimes if it's really advanced, it takes two months. So we've gone from, I wish there was something like this, to oh, it's here. And anybody that asks us anything, we generally put a team, a part of our team, they, they decide to put it in their um, roadmap to completion. The other thing is that we, I'm a surgeon, I'm a periodontist, the other part, the other people in Blue Sky Bio who are, uh, the other founders, Dr. Albert Zygmunt, he's an oral surgeon. Essentially, the people who are on our team, they have, um, in, they interview us and they use our artificial intelligence, hopefully we have the proper intelligence, to build the intelligence of a surgeon into the program. So A, it's being, f it's being, f um, it's being worked on by everybody on Dental Town and across the world and as well as by ourselves because we've essentially said, okay, deprogram us and they've, our team said, okay, how do you figure out where the mandibular canal is? Well, this is how we did it. So now the program recognizes the mandibular canal all by itself. The next version, which I think is coming soon, all you'll need to do is take a virtual tooth which is built into a library, put it where you want it, and the program will pick the diameter of the implant the position of the implant, knowing that it needs a certain amount of space between the buccal wall so that there's a blood supply, angulation, everything is built in, length, it's all there, all part of that artificial intelligence. 
Okay, let me uh, let me back you up a little bit because um, these um, these podcasts um, have exploded on iTunes. We're getting about twenty five hundred listeners uh, per episode of every single country on earth. So let's back up all the way to the beginning. Uh, what are what are you even talking about? What is um, what is Blue Sky Bio? Blue Sky Bio is a dental implant company that was founded about four, in 1998, and we did um, our research and development, and we actually first went public in terms of, not public in terms of stock market, but in terms of selling implants, about 2004. We started as a consulting group for other implant companies and eventually decided to come out on our own. So we started doing um, compatible implants, but relatively about halfway through we, we realized you know the world is going to go digital and we started developing a digital team as part of what we are so Blue Sky Bio is essentially two companies it's a digital company and it is also a dental implant company the digital company and the implant company grow in lockstep with one another um, for example Blue Sky Bio already is the number one um, treatment planning software for dental implants. I'll talk about that in a minute. It, there's a new user of Blue Sky Plan, which is our digital version of our software, every 15 minutes. We have users in every continent on Earth, for the exception of Antarctica. Um, I didn't know there was a cone beam in Kenya, did you? <laughs> yes, I was in Tanzania and Ethiopia last summer. Well, we have, we have users in almost every country in Africa, in every country in Asia. The software is in, I think, eight languages. Um, and, and, and explain the software. How, how does this, uh, what is, how, how, how much does it cost? How, how do software, they download it? Software, that's one of the reasons for its growth. And despite the fact that it's free, it's as good or better than any paid program out there. So you have programs that are $7,000 that are playing catch-up to Blue Sky Plan essentially because there's a new build every couple of weeks. What it does is a patient goes for a cone beam x-ray, which is pretty commonplace right now. Um, they get a stone model of their jaw made either before the cone beam or after. The patient is scanned in the cone beam, which is a small dental CAT scan. The stone model is also scanned in the same cone beam. And the software um, kind of almost automatically merges the two images together. The stone model, which is like a 3D model of the jaw, as well as the um, cone beam, which is a 3D x-ray, merges them together and it allows you to put an implant in exactly where you need it to be for the crown because there are virtual teeth in the program, right? A virtual tooth means a 3D image of a tooth that you can bring down from a library and position it. There's positioning tools. And then you can align your implant so that the implant really is restoration driven. And then once that's done, you can um, take the same stone model and everything is all ready and the same stone model is then scanned by what's called an optical scanner. Now you don't have to have the optical scanner. There are partner groups and labs that work with us that are also blogging on the Dental Town thread that for $30, $35 will scan your stone model in an optical scanner that will then help you merge it to the images you've gotten already and then there is simply one button that you press that will, has an artificial intelligence agent in it and it will create a guide. All the CAD CAM is essentially artificially intelligently built in there so that anybody, um, a 12 year old for example, can plan, can, probably can't plan the guide because you don't want to trust a 12 year old with that, but if you oversee what they do, the CAD CAM part is essentially pressing a couple of buttons and the software does everything else. That's what people wanted. They didn't want to have to spend weeks and weeks and weeks learning how to use a CAD CAM program. It's all built in with artificial intelligence. That's a revolution because what that's doing is it's taking ultimate plan, ultimate accuracy and bringing it to the masses. The example I like to use is when I was, I was an engineering person before I was a dentist. So I remember learning um, how to do computers on an IBM 360. An IBM 360 was the size of, I don't know, a large 14, 18 foot truck. It had to, I had to wear a winter coat in the summer to work in the room and you had the, um, the punch cards that you would write only 80 characters. 
So the world really was like that. Only people with really big computers and only people with really expensive equipment could do guided surgery. And you had to pay a lot of money because there wasn't a lot of places to get it done. Even the laboratories had to work with only a few companies. Now, every single laboratory, we aren't our own laboratory. Either the, the, the planning is done by a, a general dentist or a specialist or a lab person. They're all the same to us. So we have a tremendous network of partner laboratories that will produce a, a guide for very, very low dollars and cents. If you wanted to go ahead and plan it on your own, there people will print a guide for you for $35. If you want some help, then they charge you for that help. But nobody's holding a gun to your head anymore. It's the same revolution as when PCs happen. Now everybody has a PC. That PC revolution and the, and the, the creation of the Internet is what helped Blue Sky Bio become a force in implant dentistry. Because essentially, everybody's the same. Everybody has the same computing power. And once you have the same computer, it's a level field. So we can compete. And now everybody else can compete. There's, nobody, there's no reason why somebody in Kansas can't do the same work as somebody who's near some kind of large CAD CAM center. It's all the same now. Yeah. Uh, so, so basically, to our viewers, you have an, uh, a digital implant uh, software to help uh, that merges with a three-dimensional x-ray machine to help make guided surgeries. Right. And that and software you, is free. And that software is free. And then you actually sell implants. We actually sell implants. And that's what we did. Instead of doing the coffee cup, listen, you're, you're a doctor, you're a dentist also. And so, so was I. And the last thing we needed was a knock on that door saying, and your secretary coming in, you've got 12 patients in, in the, not 12 patients, but it always feels to the dentist like they have 12 patients. And you're in over your head and you've got to call back people and they say, there's an implant rep at the front door. What do I need that for? <laughs> and, you know, like, it, instead of that, instead of the coffee cup, instead of taking a, somebody to dinner, we figured why not just give some people what they really need, which is this powerful tool. Why not pe give the people support, just like the way you and I are communicating right now over a podcast. I can see you, you can see me. Instead of using a person who may not have ever done a surgery as your rep, as your helper, why not have a team of surgeons who can connect to you video wise live look at the cases look at the x-rays and help we you know we have enough people we can outperform in terms of support almost anybody this is all the digital revolution which could not have happened and you're part of it so if the, so to my viewer there um how does he get a, a copy of this free software would he go to um blue to bios blue sky bio, blue sky bio. Blue sky bio. com which is our our corporate blue sky bio.com Right, and he clicks, he or she will click on, on the top, it says software. And right there is a whole page, and there's a little icon, you click on it, it asks you Mac and, or, you know, Mac or um, Windows, and you download whichever version you have. The software works the same, whether it's Mac, it's different versions of the software, but it's, it'll, there's one version of the software for Mac, another version for Windows, they look and operate exactly the same. Obviously, the coding behind it is different because one, they're working on different operating systems. They're both available. You download it, and you're off to the races. There are video tutorials. Um, there are, there we have a, a dedicated teaching staff online where people who are running into problems after they watch the video, they want a little explanation here and there. We have people that talk to them. It's all free. That's our rep. That's our knocking on the door. Okay, so so so, so then on the software, so now this person has a CBCT. They're going to need either, either have, have a CCT, or they have those little vans that drive to them with a cone beam sitting inside. Well, they'll refer to usually usually people get friendly with an orthodontist. A lot of orthodontists have cone beams now, so they'll refer to the cone to the orthodontist, or it might be an endodontist who doesn't place implants. Can you can you do me a favor and image the case for me? And there's also people who are friends who have. Four or five docs will get together and they'll do a cone beam and they'll share it. And you know what oral surgeons and periodontists, you know what the smart ones tell me? They said that this person always did bridges and partials and dentures and bridges and partial dentures and they never referred him a sinus lift or anything. And then the referring doctor got into starting to place a single implant here and there. And now they just see implants and now their referrals for you know, four on the floor and, you know, full mouth uh, stuff that they don't want to get into um, has skyrocketed. So you got to think in hope, growth, and abundancy, not fear and scarcity. I, I think if periodontists and oral surgeons are afraid of a general dentist 
um, doing uh, placing some implants. I, I think it's the wrong thinking. I, I, the, the software is designed for everybody. I mean, a lot of our users, we, we, although it sounds like we're a general practitioner implant company, the opposite is essentially true. Most of our implants are actually sold to specialists um, because we started it that way. Both I'm a, I'm a specialist and, my, and Dr. Zickman, who is the other founder, is, a, is an oral surgeon. Um, that's who currently are most of our customers in terms of the implants purchased. Um, they recognize a very good, well-designed implant at a reasonable cost, but we also want to give the tools to everybody. I, the, the, the specialist generalist issues are an issue only in the United States, so to speak. In, um, in Asia, in Europe, there aren't that many specialists and people who decide themselves to try to work harder on it. But here in the United States, I do see that the people who help their referrers do something, they get a lot of referrals. I saw it in my own practice. I had one of the large, I'm told I had at the time one of the largest implant practices in the United States. We did well over a thousand implants a year. And we did that because we dedicated our staff to assisting the restorative docs. I stopped using implant reps to walk to the doctor's office. I had a dedicated staff and team member that would help with the impressions, that would go there with the instruments. I would stop by. I would have them at the, my office. I would teach them how to do grafts. I would teach them how to do simple implants. And my practice just zoomed. Um, and I got all the more difficult cases. <laughs> And it is silly where when you go to a country like Korea, 15,000 out of 20,000 dentists place an implant last year. And then you come to America and 9 out of 10 general dentists have never placed an implant in their life ever. Korea has three to four times the utilization of the United States. When people ask me what do I think the expansion capabilities of the United States are, we're doing only one-third of the implants we could be compared to Korea. Israel has 700% more utilization per capita than the United States. Explain the math on that. Can you do the math? There's, yeah. There are seven, per capita, there are seven times more implants placed in Israel than in the United States. If you, Israel, I believe Israel, is, that's the highest utilization in the world, I believe. So there's about eight million people in Israel, and so um, Israel is uh, placing the same number of implants um, as 54 million uh, uh, several states put together, equaling 54 million in the United States. Korea, which I think is about 90 million, something like that, is placing um, almost as many implants as the United States in total. Yeah, and it's sad because when someone comes in and they um, they only brush maybe once a day, they've never flossed, uh, and this tooth is bombed out, and they just, you're not going to change the behavior of this person. Then they, they do a, a heroic root canal buildup, crown lengthening, the behavior doesn't change, and if they just would have placed an implant in a crown, the bugs couldn't have eaten it. That's that's a, that is a view, but then there's also a lot of a, a lot of people who lose lose it to because of trauma or genetics and periodontal disease and so on and so forth. And the the numbers of people it's has quite a question of training. That's why there's so much demand for training. That's why dental towns impl I, I don't know what the number one th um, group is viewed on dental town. But you, it's a great experiment. I believe it's the endophiles. Is that correct? That's the number one. And I think maybe cosmetics is number two. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. And number three is the implant. Block. Implants, yes. Okay. So the, right now, the number three area in terms of interest on Dentaltown is impl are implants. Yet the number of people trained in the United States who placed an implant probably approaches around 10 to 15% of the population. I'm not talking about restoring. I'm talking about placing. So we have a long way to go in terms of people being trained. Now, just because you're trained doesn't mean you want to do it. Doesn't mean you're going to do it. But at least a person's eyes will be open towards it. Or maybe they'll do three or four or five a year. But the desire and that thirst for education is there, which is why Dentaltown is so important. Well, let, let me ask you a question, Sheldon, because you're a periodontist. Um, periodontics is, pro that, of all the nine specialties, that's probably has changed more in our lifetime than any other specialty. Would you agree with that? I stopped, I stopped doing perio in 1996. I referred out my perio. So, so explain I, why I, that, I, would I, you agree that that profession day, has changed the most? One day I was doing a sinus lift and the hygienist asked me to check a patient in the middle of a sinus lift and I said, that's crazy. I said to myself, why am I torturing myself? That day I said to the, to the hygienist that was in my office, I said, you've got a month off with pay. That's the good news. The bad news is 
I'll write you a very good love recommendation. I walked over to the front, on the spur of the moment, I walked over to the, to the receptionist and I said, you're going to send out a letter now to all of our maintenance patients that are going back to their GP or to another periodontist, and I'm done. <laughs> I'm not doing perio anymore. And that is, now that doesn't mean that that's what other people should do, but that's what I did uh, because I think it's possible. And I um, was not practicing in Manhattan. I was practicing in Brooklyn, New York. It's part of New York City. But nevertheless, it's a neighborhood-driven city. I was practicing in a particular neighborhood. And people tended either to get on the local train and go to Manhattan or they stayed in their neighborhood. People didn't usually go to a different neighborhood to a different dentist. So it's a lot like a small town structure, even though it's in a city. And I said, you know what? I'm going to do just implant placement, and that's it. And I'll help my restorative guys restore, my store of guys and gals restore, and that's what I did. <laughs> well, you're a periodontist. What, what would, what, what do you think's um, going to last longer? Um, crown lengthening and heroic perio surgeries, or lose a tooth and replace it with titanium? I think that the the numbers of crown lengthenings that are being done in the United States probably speak for that by themselves. I myself stopped, almost stopped doing uh, crown length things by the mid 90s. Um, and certainly uh, root splits and frications. Can they last a long time? Sure. I was trained at Penn. I was 25 years of retrospect from Dr. Morton Amsterdam, who passed away recently. All those things. I lived in two different worlds. Um, I think the world is changing. I think that people, not everybody, but I think that people do want something that is reliable which is why the patients themselves are driving the desire for implants. That's what's going on. And, and the need for, by, by everybody to suddenly get really um, versed in implants and the digital side of implants is so great right now because people want and realize that they've got to satisfy the patient demands. The patients want to have something reliable, a lot like LASIK. The demand for LASIK in terms of having your vision corrected is not coming from the LASIK company. It's patients themselves or people themselves who look at their friends and say, oh, I had this done, I can see well, it's great, I don't need my glasses anymore. That's what's driving the LASIK revolution. In implantology, that's being driven by the patients. The patients want this. The LASIK surgery was, I still think, the uh, greatest gift I ever gave to myself. It was $4,000 and what people don't realize, it's not to get rid of your glasses. Um, you know, they told me I had 2020 with glasses. After LASIK, they told me I had 2020, but I could see twice as good. I mean, my boys, so many times I'd be somewhere with my boys, I'd say, and like in her backyard, and I go, wow, look at that ledge there. Is that, what is that, an indentation? Like, dad, are you kidding me? We've lived here 20 years. There's a road up there. I mean, I mean, you, you just see so much better. Um, but implants is, um, it's just huge. So I, I'm gonna go back to specifics. So this person's driving to work. Uh, most of my viewers, are going to be on iTunes on our commute to work. Um, right. So they're, or, or maybe they're coming home from work. So they're going to go to blueskybio.com. Do you have one like overall video that they can watch to sum this all up? Or how, how would, what would they do first? Because they're probably thinking, I download this on my computer. I got a CBCT. How do I get that CBCT read into that um, software? And second of all, you talked about a lab. Um, doing an uh, 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 optical scan. How do I find a lab? I'm in Phoenix, it's all, Arizona. It's all on there. It's all on. If you spend a little bit, there's two ways. This ha three ways this happens. Okay. One way this happens is somebody could be slightly more involved technically, and they go on the website and they see, okay, it's step by step videos through for the whole process, as well as all the partner labs. That's one way they can just find their way around on it, which is how a lot of people throughout the world do it. Because um, they don't have the, the necessarily the time zone or they don't have the language skills necessarily in English to call up the second or whatever to send an email. The second is to send an email. Look, I'm I'm a newbie with this. I'd like a little bit of help. Can you help me? We have a dedicated digital staff that will email back and forth and guide them. That's step number two. Step number three. What is, is that email address? It's plan p l a n at, at blueskybio.com. Blue yeah, they send p l a n at blueskybio.com. If they download the software, it autom and they, there's automatically, it automatically wants to generate a license, and it tells you how to do it when you download it. And when you do that and send in for the request for the license, within 30 seconds, the computer, our servers, send back a license code, and then within a day or two, you get a personal email 
from the digital director says, hi there, my name is Michael, can I help you? So that's also there, and it's all free. Or they'll send me an email and say, Sheldon, or they'll send Albert an email. We're very visible. I'll give you my personal email address. It's not a big deal. It's learner, L-E-R-N-E-R, at blueskybio.com. They'll send me an email and say, Sheldon, I feel a little bit lost. What do I do next? No problem. We'll take care of it. And you are amazing like that. You are very, very giving yourself. Um, and so then, um, and when you said it plans the implant, um, the, the, you're talking about the length and the diameter and the length of the implant? That would be the next, next version. Right now, you still have to pick your length and your width and kind of orient the implant and tweak it a little bit. The next version, which is coming out in about a month, will actually do a lot of the artificial, has a lot more artificial intelligence built in, and it will make a lot of the decisions I can't say make the decisions for you because that would be a scary to me. I still want the pilot landing the plane even though he has autopilot or she has autopilot. Uh, but it does it in a way that you should only need to tweak it. That'll be the next version. In addition, the, the guide itself will, this is again for people who've done it a while, the stops will be built in, the heights will be built in, a lot of things that you normally have to think about or tweak, it's all done for you. A lot of the artificial intelligence will be built in. Okay, Sheldon, a lot of my questions I ask you are just because I try to, I'm trying to think of what questions are. You know, Dental Town, no one has to practice solo again. So does this only work with your implants? Does your no. software only work with your implants? No, it works with everybody's implants. Uh, okay. The next, like two versions from now, you'll be able to, most of the libraries of implants will be on there already. So if somebody has the unfortunate misconception to use somebody else's implants other than Blue Sky Bios, they will be able to choose from a library of their own implants until they learn better that there are better places to get them. Obviously, I'm speaking tongue-in-cheek here. Right. Um, but, but and, and so they can just pick their own brand because their own brand will be up there. But right now, let's say if they don't find their brand, since our, ours are compatible, they match the different implants, you can pick ours and it'll match in terms of the length, width, and the taper. Or if they have an unusual implant or something that it's not in our library or we're not compatible with, the software allows you to create what's called a custom implant. That custom implant has a height, a width, an apical diameter. They plug that in and it sends, it will give you a form of an implant that meets your, your custom criteria. So any implant can be, can be manufactured. Well, you and I have a similar story. Um, I started a dental town selfishly for myself. When I put my kids to bed, I was... I was all worried about the next day's cases and I, I just wanted a place to go talk to other dentists. So I, I started Dental Town only for me. Uh, Bob Ibsen started Rembrandt Toothpaste just because he couldn't stand uh, how the toothpastes took the luster off the uh, his, his composite fillings. Right. And that was the birth of Rembrandt. So why did a periodontist and oral surgeon, why did you guys start your own implant company? Because Sheldon, there, I think at IDS in Cologne, there were 275 implant companies that just had a booth. I mean. How many implant companies are there, and what would make a periodontist and an oral surgeon start their own company? What did the others not do for you that a uh, periodontist and oral surgeon said, we just, we're just going to do this ourselves? We're ancient history, so we are, we've been around for a while. I started practice in 1980, and because I was an engineer, implant companies were coming to me. And, you know, it's really nice to say that, oh, I was so smart, and I did this, and I'm so smart, and I did that. And this is what happened. I did it. I did it. I didn't do it. What essentially happened was a series of events that maybe one day over a beer, you and I will sit and talk, that can only be, I'm a, I'm a faithful person, only could say that there is a God somewhere who basically created a situation where I had to do this. I made a lot of, lot of mistakes thinking that I could do this easily, or Albert and I think that we could do this easily. Essentially what happened is we had a patent. We approached the company. The, the company said, great, we love what you want to do. We're going to pay you X number of money. We're going to give you a percentage. And it sounded great to us. They, we signed off on the paperwork. We sent it in. By the time it got there, everybody in the company had been fired, including the CEO. I don't know why. I was very upset. A year later, the new CEO calls us and says, I just finished going through all the paperwork. We really like your idea. Come down. So we went down, and they had a team of like 15 engineers and a supercomputer downstairs that they were going to test our design on. When we finished our presentation, they turned to each other and said, we don't need to test it, it's fine. They sent us the paperwork, we signed it, we sent it in, and can you guess what happened? He got fired. Everybody got fired. <laughs> Nothing to do with us. So we said, you know what, 
if what we did, the two of us and our engineers, they don't, they didn't even have to test it. Maybe we know just as much as they do. Let's start our own implant company. This goes back uh, in 19, so it goes back in the year 2000. So silly, we thought it was going to take a quarter of a million dollars of our own funds and a year or two to do. A couple of houses later, you know, it's that's ah, another fifty thousand dollars. That's eh, another fifty thousand. It's another hundred. Another couple of houses later, we had an implant company and, a, and our first implant. So uh, if I had known what it was going to cost, how much time it was going to take, and so on and so forth, I never would have done it. Never. So what 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 did you think of so unique that actually got you a patent? I mean, a patent is an incredibly hard thing to get. How did you get a patent on Im dental implants? The crazy thing is that the pat it is a very good implant. Um, and it's a really good patent. We never commercially made it. Huh. It's the okay. crazy part of it. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to ask you a question that uh, um, everyone's thinking out there. Um, when you go to a, um, when, when you go to uh, the IDS meeting, which is Europe's biggest meeting, and there's like 100,000 dentists there for a week, right. and you see 275 different implant companies, what would you say to a uh, general dentist driving his car saying, um, come on, Shell, isn't titanium, titanium, titanium? I mean, how, how does the body know the difference in Adidas and Nike? It is. It is. Titanium is titanium, titanium. The major difference is going to be the following. How easy is it to use and is, and is the implant designed from the surgical perspective of somebody who's placed it? Some of the biggest implant companies have the most clunky placement systems. I remember, I won't mention the name of the company, of needing to use two hands to remove a mount with a ratchet going one way and a stabilizer going the other, one of our first patents that we did use was a way of placing an implant without needing to have a mount, without the need of a mount. Um, and so th that perspective of surgery and engineering together works. There are very few companies where the, the designers are actually surgeons. So there are only a few designer, implant designers in the world. There's probably a half a dozen of us. That's it. The rest of the companies just straight out try to copy. So we're, we make compatible implants. We also clone or whatever. But it's done in a way that surgically it's a better implant to place and it is more reasonable in terms of what it, how it handles and so on and so forth. That's one. The second thing is that out of the 200 and something implant companies, there are only less than half a dozen that have a digital force. And there is nobody currently that combines the ease of use and the ability to, there is not a single, there is not a single implant company out there that has a, the ability for a, a, a periodontist sitting in a room somewhere to spend five minutes planning a case and press one or two buttons and make a guide. That combination of the digital viewpoint as well as the surgical viewpoint as well as reasonable costs made in America, so on and so forth, that, that is a pretty tough combination to go after. So, Sheldon, when Harvard Business Review studies the, uh, the most successful CEOs versus the least successful as far as profitability, and they're looking for character traits of the leaders, and, the, and just by publicly available information, they always come to the conclusion that humility is the top trait. Um, the most successful CEOs are humble, and they listen to their customers. They listen to uh, their dentists. As the owner of Dentaltown, I'm always dealing with all these upset companies because someone made a complaint about their product. How do you describe, why do you think you were so counterintuitive that you saw that as just awesome information that you didn't sit there and say, you can't say that or you can't say that. We're listening. We're going to make those changes. We'll have a new update in 30 days. And how come you are an owner and listening to the customers on Dentaltown when everyone else just wants no one to say anything about their product or their company? Um, it has to probably do by the way I was raised um, and the way that Dr. Zickman was raised. We were raised in a particular way um, and in a particular fashion. Let's, let's put it this way. The most uncomfortable, I'm at my most uncomfortable sitting after a uh, classical music concert. Nothing bad about it. I like classical music. And the conductor comes out for curtain bows. My skin's crawling one curtain bow, another curtain bow, it's all, it's all orchestrated. And, and that is so against how I was raised and how the world that I grew up in, that I, I it has nothing to do, I mean, that's, that's how I was brought up. I mean, how do you, how do, you do that and say, it's me, it's me, it's me? It's, it's not. <laughs> it isn't. 
It's all those guys over there who are playing. They work hard too. They should be the ones getting up and bailing. I, I just I just think it's it's amazing. I mean, if every CEO of every dental company should see those four million posts on Dental Town as their free market research. I mean, if all the dentists are saying, God, I wish it wasn't blue, I wish it was red, wouldn't the smart guy just say, okay, let's make it red? I'll, I'll say it right now to all the implant reps and all the CEOs that having, having, and uh, maybe Albert will kill me for saying this, but it's the kudos are to you and to the people in Dentaltown. The, the, we have the largest research organization in the world, and that's called Dentaltown. And we, it's not only Dentaltown, obviously people email us and call us all the time. We really listen. Because actually, the reason why Blue Sky Bio started is because people wouldn't listen to us. We were lecturing for another implant company. We kept telling them that there's a problem here, um, and they wouldn't listen. And I kept saying, well, I'm having this problem. Now, the next sentence is something you might recognize. And every single person who's ever placed an implant will have heard this sentence. I hate this sentence. Well, doctor, we're not hearing it from anybody else but you. you right, that? right. Right. So baloney. Oh, I know. I it's know. So, when I went through that, I have a drawer. There's a certain implant from Germany that doesn't exist anymore that had some kind of a plastic insert. We won't mention. I'm not mentioning the name. Don't you mention the name either. I put 400 of them in. And you know where the 400 were? Well, 400 at the end. You can't see it right now. I don't have, this is not the drawer. But 400 of them after five years ended up in my drawer. All, not all 400, probably 395. And when I said, like, why are all these things failing? They would say, well, doctor, it's all you. It turned out to be that the HA coating was melting. You, you remember. I don't mm -hmm. know, Absolutely. You, know, which I'm, you probably know what I'm talking about. The yeah. HA coating was melting on it, and the implants ended up, ended up going bye-bye, and the plastic insert was fracturing. It was like, what do you mean I'm the only one? I'm not crazy. So, you know, after that happens to you as a clinician, and it happened, it happened to me, you, I never think as a business CEO person, I always think, about my patients who were my, my patients. Although I'm not practicing anymore, but they're still there. Okay, now I want you to take off your Dr. Lerner pairing on his hat, and I want you to put on your Dr. Phil hat, because you and I um, have lectured all around the world, and we've graduated in the 80s, and we know that three out of four dentists in Korea and Israel placed an implant uh, probably last month. And we're, we're talking 80% of our audience right now is America and 95 of 100 have never placed an implant in their life. Uh, they're driving to work right now and they're just saying, and they're thinking, um, Sheldon, I, I'm, I'm kind of scared. Uh, I'm not really a blood and guts person. Um, I, I, I don't know, this just seems a little overwhelming. Put on your dad hat. What if your daughter just walked out of dental school and she never did a surgical training implant? Why should she learn how to place an implant? And why should she commit to this? Because you know, she she has to decide she wants to do this. Why should she drive into work right now and decide, okay, Sheldon, okay, Howard, I'm going to commit to placing an implant someday. Talk to that person. Okay, so there was a time where people didn't want to do bonding. I, I know it's hard to believe, but you went to dental school, you learned how to do bonding. When I went to dental school, I had to get special permission and a signature in order to do a bonded restoration. The patient had to sign off that that was, you know, something that was going to fail and so on and so forth. And the, the, the light activation for, for us, I go back a long time, light activation for, was just invented that year. You know, that type, that's how far back it went. And I think of the revolution that has occurred in cosmetic dentistry. And imagine that you, at that time, were not going to do cosmetic dentistry. You were going to say, I'm not doing any bonding. I'm just doing amalgam restorations, gold, and porcelain infused to metal. And could you imagine doing that right now after what you've done in dental school? And the answer would be, no, not, no, I don't. And I said, this is the revolution that you're, we're actually in the midst right now of. It, it, it sounds strange to people who are already placing implants, but the revolution is already there. It's, it, you will either be part of it or you will be the same dentist who doesn't do bonding. Um, when I, my last day in practice was, I think, 2010 or 2011. I remember looking at the patient. I just finished an all-on four. And I looked at the patient, and I came back, especially because I promised her a year before that I would take care of her. And I said to her, when I graduated dental school in 1980, 
I, my, first restora- my first thing I did was I put in an amalgam restoration. And right now, I have never, t- today is the last day, there's not one single thing that I've learned or used in dentistry that I'm using now 30 years later. In other words, I, I, was, I injected with a 30-gauge needle. What 30-gauge needle in 1980, right? I was using Marcane. What's that in 1980? I was using implants. What's that in 1980? The, the people who were going to be, there will be, there'll be two kinds of dentists. Well, there'll be three kinds of dentists. There'll be dentists who don't do digital. They're going to just, they're going to, that's something that's going to happen there. You're not in, if you're not in the digital world, that's going to hit you. Um, if you're not in the implant world, that's the same as not doing cosmetic bonding or cosmetic dentistry right now. You're going to have to change. You don't have a choice. Um, Sheldon, how come I um, see people Dentists all the time that say, no, I don't think I can do that. But they, they pull teeth. They'll, they'll, they'll pull molars. It's like, well, how, is, how can you pull a molar and not put in an implant? Well, right. That's one of the things you actually asked me. How, how, does that, how does that go? If somebody right now is not extracting teeth, if a periodontist is not extracting teeth, um, it's unlikely that they will be able to develop an implant practice. So the first, it's, they're not really, people aren't really being taught generally how to place implants. The first step in placing an implant is to learn how to extract it hey, traumatically. And on Dentaltown, and as in other places, some of the hottest courses on right now are not placing implants. It's step one. How do I extract the tooth atraumatically? And that those courses are being attended by periodontists, those courses are being attended by oral surgeons who trained in a different era, and those courses are being um, attended to by general practitioners. You need to learn how to take out a tooth. If you're not taking out a tooth, you're not going to place an implant. Oh, you said you said take out a tooth atraumatically. Atraumatically. A- any of these courses you recommend, or any of these techniques to atraumatically remove a tooth? There's plenty out there. Um, I think that there's actually a dental town thing called Murph or something. Somebody Tommy, Murph. Mur- Tommy Murphy. Uh, yeah, and I I haven't been. And for example, you know you've heard of Garg. He's also on on blogs in Dental Town. So Arun Garg runs what people think is an implant training program, and that's true. But level one, Arun will tell you himself. Level one is going to the Dominican Republic and under supervision, learning how to remove a tooth traumatically. It's a full course by him and very well attended. He said well, that, he said he instituted that because the people were coming in and having the teeth extracted in an, a traumatic fashion and many of the patients that were coming back to him to get implants in the Dominican Republic and training, they weren't candidates. I've seen it myself. We had a, we had a Dominican training center. The patients mostly weren't candidates. They didn't have enough bone. And so most of the work was being done in an advanced, guy, advanced treatment places to try to replace bone. He says, now that I've made a course on how to atraumatically place implants and graft, everybody coming back is an, a, is an A-easy case. That's number one. So the first step is I'm not going to – people who say I'm going to go to a class and learn how to place implants in a weekend, I think they're fooling themselves. Dentists – I'm not going to sit there and scream about dental schools, <laughs> but dental schools aren't teaching what they need to teach right now, which is how to atraumatically extract teeth when the patient really needs to atraumatically extract teeth. Once they learn that, that's, there are certain tools they can use. Um, they can use, um, there's three or four companies that have special tools to extract teeth. There are periotomes or mechanical periotomes. There's the piezosurgery unit, which is an expensive toy. I have, I had one. The biggest use I had was to extract teeth by cutting it out through by cutting the PDL. There are all kinds of tools and toys to learn how to extract teeth. There's a full there are full courses on it. The idea of grabbing with a plier, racking buckly and lingually to try to break the buckle plate to get the tooth out, that's that's done. I know crazy. it's still in school, but it's it's crazy. That's not how it should be done. Well, and, and just to just give you one little um, experience, what he's talking about is uh, just exactly you know these to. Uh, when we were in oral surgery, you know, they laid out all these forceps and pliers. It was, it was a muscle job. And, yeah. and, now, and now by just pushing like, a, like an elevator, um, like a periosteal, all the way around the tooth. A several, periosteal is a long, tiny, skinny, thicker knife that goes and sneaks in between the periodontal ligament and the bone. It severs the periodontal ligament. And then you rock the tooth measly and distally, not buccalingually, with small little elevators to get it loose. And then you grab the tooth and you pull it occlusally. I, I, that was actually the course I taught. I met Dr. Zickman because I taught a course in extractions for an implant company, 
And Albert Zickman, who was an oral surgeon, was teaching how to do plastic surgery in the oral cavity for implants, which is supposed to be a periodontist job. And we thought that was funny, and we got together that way. But that's true. The truth is that you need to be able to learn that skill, which is luxate measly distally, cut the teeth out with, um, with what's called a peritone, which is a, an elevator, which, has, which looks like a perioprol, but the elevator tip is flexible and thin that goes inside and cuts the PDL. And that's how you luxate measly distally get the tooth out. There are other devices that help you as well. There's uh, two or three different devices. Uh, Titan has one that uses like little endo posts that screw inside and has something that looks like from the Marquis de Sade. You screw it down and it pops the tooth out. Ben Benex has one also. They're not cheap, but this is the world we live in. This is. And I want to add one more instrument that they don't sell on this technique, and that is, um, um, you know, hydraulics. If you ever see a dump load truck, you know, by by pushing fluid in there, you can lift infinite amount of weight. And right. that, that's what happens when the body's swelling. And a lot of the time, these kids, uh, they're, they're just trying to rush and force this out. And if they would slow down and keep elevating, and those older guys know that sometimes He's when it's waiting. just not giving, that's a good time to go do a hygiene check, go to right. the bathroom, go right. check your email, and then you come yeah, back. Yeah, swell and push it up. And that tooth is just waving in the wind. So just slow down, let Mother Nature do it. Um, so so then, okay, so now I'm... All by myself, I'm dental. I'm dental town solving the uh, no dentist Praxel again. I'm now at a convention. I see uh, 275 different uh, implant companies, but right now I, I I get to talk to the owner, the founder of uh, Blue Sky Bio. Why should I buy your your implant? Because I'm gonna I'm gonna be sitting in your earphones. <laughs> <laughs> for, for, for the relationships, is what you're saying. The unique yeah, is the I mean, relation. It's, it's, it, I, I, listen, I walked through the same IDS Cologne meeting, and I walked together with Albert Zickman, and, and Albert was, he's probably going to listen to this, he was a little depressed. He said, how are we going to survive? I said, Albert, there's a big difference here. We're not in any of those booths. When people work with us, they're working with a surgical team. They're not working with somebody who's got to sell you something in order to make a bonus for the, for the Christmas holiday. We're not, that's not who we are. So they're, they're working with a team. We have, that's one of the reasons why we have, we, we partner with Educate. The, the sum of the parts is greater than the individuals. Yes, I could sit there and tell them why our implants are great and wonderful and so on, and they are. They, they so, what, so what I just heard you say is, you know, you can buy an implant from a faceless institution or you can buy an implant from a, a real person, you, who they're staring at right now on Dental Town and YouTube. We have, we have all the engineers we need. I mean, we could always use more. We have all the machining stuff that's all done in California and, and Pennsylvania and Minnesota. It's all done in the U.S. We have the lawyers. We have the accountants. We have the, the, um, the business people. We have what we call the suits. But there's one thing that, so we don't do that anymore. What we do is we are available. We decided to, you know what? We're going to be the people that do the support. When somebody calls up and says, I've got this case. I'm not sure how to restore it. You speak to us. I know that doesn't sound very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? That's so low and it's beneath me and so on. No, that's my only job. My job is only to be on the phone. That's what I do because that's what, I, what Albert and I do because we can't hire that. I placed over 10,000 implants in my career. Albert, almost the same. Where am I going to get somebody who could sit there on the telephone and have that amount of experience and be able to speak to somebody. So you know what? I do it. Are we adding people that do it? Yes, we are currently adding surgeons who are a little bit older. They're cutting back on their time. They have one thing that, that nobody else, no rep can do. They've placed thousands of implants. And those are the people that are taking the phone calls. And you're completely transparent. I mean, I, I'm always amazed on Dental Town how available you are. I mean, you're, you're an amazing guy. But I, I'm going to go back to the kids, though. Because, um, again, we're in a country where 9 out of 10 people have never done this. Um, we've been around the block for three decades. What lasts longer? Uh, uh, you know, a 65 year old man comes in, broken down, failed root canal, it's to the bone. What lasts longer? Uh, heroic post buildup and a full cast gold crown it's, or pulling that into an implant? The world is already, for those people who place implants, they've already decided that, that the better restoration is an implant. And the patients themselves have decided as well. I mean, I, again, I practiced doing implants from, my first implant was in 81, okay? And so I placed them for a long time. So after a while, the 
the patients themselves would come to me and say, I broke this tooth, I don't want to do, I want an, I want an implant. And so they are self-referring after a while. So even though my practice was a referral practice, I never restored, I only, I only placed. But 30 to 50% of my patients were self-referred, just like the LASIK. You know you want, your friend just had the LASIK surgery, they can see, you want to see the same way, you're self-referred. Those patients will hear from you. That's one of the reasons why my daughters, daughters would hear from me that, listen, it's going to pass you by because if you don't do this, your patients are going to walk someplace else. That doesn't mean you have to do that. You can establish a relationship with a specialist, a very close relationship where they can do it for you as well. But you can also do the easy ones. It's not so difficult if you choose to. If you don't feel comfortable extracting a tooth because the blood bothers you, and there's a number of dentists that are that way, not a lot, but there are a number of them, they're not going to get involved in implants, and that's okay. But there are a large number that would. The person who took over my practice is teaching every single person they can in their area to do implants and has a course for it. Um, Jerome Smith doesn't put, he does some stuff on Dental Town, but he used to do a lot. He's a little bit older and a lot busier. He made sure that, I, I, I think the cleaning ladies in his county know how to put implants in. He trained everybody. And that's why he's very busy. He's got, I think, three dedicated surgeons. What I did in my practice is I said, okay, I'm going to teach people how to do extractions and grafts. They want to do an implant, that's great. And they refer me more patients. But I'm going to, as a periodontist, I'm going to make sure that they that I get them a custom abutment if they want it, or a stock abutment if they want it. I'm going to make sure the patient comes to, with a temporary if they want it. A certain periodontists listening to this, again, I can say to you, most of the people who purchase our implants are specialists because they want a better implant. If I may throw in a little word like that. And so they, they how do they deal with it? Well, we, I, I speak to them. Many of them put in a thousand plus implants here. How do they do that in an environment if there's so many general practitioners who are starting to get involved in it? It's very simple. They make sure they ask the GP, what do you, what does he or she want? Well, many of them want that abutment in place. Many of them want the temporary. Many of them want assistant placing the custom abutment and or the restoration, and they send it to them. Some, the, you have on Dentaltown a genius. He's not from the United States. His name is Bill Schaefer. I don't know if you've ever seen his name. Yes. Bill, Bill, I don't know how he did it, but Bill has permission to walk on water. He is the most super trained, probably one of the more super trained people we have in dental town. The guy's a head and neck surgeon, excuse me, and he's a dentist, and he decided to do dentistry, right? But when you Where's speak- Where's he from? England, he's from, he's from- That's um, right. He's That's from right. B, B, he's from Brighton. Brighton, that's right. He's Brighton. He, he has a full digital lab in his facility, and he's a referral practice, because he's supporting his referrers by generating all the custom abutments, all the restorations, with her help digitally. And he's doing 1,700 implants a year, excuse me? <laughs> Why? How? He's a specialist. Because the man decided that, you know, the way around this is to support my referrers to the nth degree. And if you're a specialist and all you're doing is sending, there are certain people who want you only to send it back with the cover screw and the, and the healing abutment. I understand that. There's a lot of people who don't. There's a lot of people who even are wanting that, cost, that healing abutment back, but want the digital help. The world will be, five years from now, the world will be that the specialist will be, help, will be the helper in the digital support world. That's where it's going. Will you send your buddy Bill an uh, email and tell him to do a podcast with me? I'm trying, I, I, I've offered to fly him to America. <laughs> I will let him know. Yeah, um, I think, I think, I think I, very early though, because he's on English time. Yes. Hey, um, but, um, but go, go back a little bit. We, um, you know, we always talk about dentistry as if we are engineers. It's always building a bridge or a canal or it's always, but at the end of the day, isn't dentistry really about biology? Because at the end of the day, it's the termites eating the house. It's the bacteria eating the barn. And I, 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 I'm a huge implant fan just because Streptococcus mutans doesn't eat titanium. And I want you to weigh in on this. There's a lot of people who think that, well, if you pull a tooth in a patient had periodontal disease, they're still going to have, uh, they're still going to, it's like, it's like if you test positive to herpes and pull the tooth, you still test positive to herpes. So if you have periodontal disease in your mouth and you pull the teeth, you still test positive to P. gingivalis. So a lot of people are concerned that 
you're going to get periodontal disease around the implant. You're a periodontist. Speak I, on I, that. that. I think the studies that show that the, that that peri that in, uh, peri peri implantology does not have the same bacteria or does not have the same causes as periodontal disease. Those studies occurred in the 80s. That's all, the only reason why people don't know them because people don't go back and read the literature that's 30 years old. That's an old question that's been handled already. There is no relationship between periodontal disease and implantology, but there is some relationship to people who have some, some we'll call them end-line dentition, where they're not brushing their teeth and they allow plaque and bacteria to sit there next to an implant because it happens to be on a tooth. So there is, if you leave a bad tooth next to an implant, the, the periodontal progression is going to go ahead and eat up the attachment on the adjacent tooth. That's going to happen as well, well let me, which let me, is why people are doing what they call clearances. They don't talk, they're not talking about a Macy's clearance. <laughs> they're talking about somebody who just can't take care of their mouth and they're taking out all the teeth and placing four or five implants and placing a restoration on there. Those are, the, the, you have to think long and hard. You're, you're, ident, you're edentulating a person, but the reason they're doing that is because there is some cross-reactive, but only if you put an implant directly next to a periodontally involved tooth. Okay, so, so you're saying um, an implant next to a tooth that has tartar and buildup and periodic control. That, that's not a good idea. Periodontal disease with this suppuration. But, but tell, me, tell me if this uh, bothers you because it bothers me. I see a lot of patients come in that have four, five, or six implants and they've been connected with the bar and the bar is just buried in the gum. Mm -hmm. And there's just really, I mean, I, you, they can take out their denture, but they can only brush a bar. They, they can't get under the, the bar. Uh, is, is, that, is that an issue in, to you, a periodontist? cleansability of these bars? I, I would think that it would be. Well, part of the reason why it's not so cleansable is because there's, again, this is somewhat controversial, so I'm going to catch some stuff, but there is the need for attached gingiva around an implant also, and the need has to do with preventing, you know, in the old days, there are people who would still are. People would never take a denture out, and they would get eupolis fissure out, and they would get this overgrowth of tissue around the denture. It would almost be like there's a separate gum that was growing over the denture holding it in place. People who have an aged population know what I'm talking about right away. There's no difference between that and what's going on around the bar. The bar, if there's no attached gingiva around the bar and there is some food impaction or hygiene issues, the tissue is going to respond because it's mucosa, plain um, non-epithelial, non-epithelialized, keratinized, not, not it is epithelized, but not keratinized tissue, it's going to just overgrow the same way as it does in a denture. So that's why there's a real need for attached gingiva around implants. When you see that bar, it's for two reasons. A, the bar, like you said, is not cleansable. And B, there's no attached gingiva around that, those implants to allow for the tissue to remain tied down. So you get, an, you get what amounts to be, um, I, listen, if I was in a... Um, if I was an academician, I, my whole life would be around getting something named after me. I mean, I'm not an academician, but if I was to coin a phrase, I would call it um, bar fissuratum as opposed to, you know, whatever, den, uh, fissuratum around a denture. So it, there's a bar fissuratum because there's not enough attached gingiva around many bars and it doesn't create cleansability. That's a hard, that's a hard one. And, you, and I also want you to weigh in on something else. Um, um, you know, a lot of times people talk about all on four, and I know that's a brand name, but it's really just a concept. It's four implants and everything. But then a lot of people come back and say, yeah, but it's none on three, meaning mm -hmm. you lose you lose one implant, you lost the case. What mm -hmm. I don't understand, I see a lot of cases where someone, someone's paid 15, 20,000 bucks for an arch, mm -hmm. and it, it's like on four. It's like, do they not understand spare tires or do, would you want some leeway? I mean, with the price of implants plummeting from where they started out when I got out of school in 87 to now, um, shouldn't like, because a lot of these people that lost their teeth, they were smokers or they did have diabetes or they were obese so they didn't have the best home care. And now you got a whole case, you know, so you have this person had all this background behavior why they lost all their teeth. And now they gave you a lot of money and, and it all comes down to where one little implant fails and we've lost the whole darn case. That just doesn't seem rational to me. And, and I want, and I want, and, and further note, I want to make one more uh, stay before I forget it. Cause we're down a minute, but you know why I believe a lot of these dentists don't place implants? You know, doctors are surrounded by a lot of people that just say, yes, sir, yes, doctor, yes, doctor. They're hygienists, assistant, office manager, patients, spouse. Almost no one stands up to the doctor. And I want to tell the doctor that um, I'll stand up to you. I'm, I'm not here to be your friend. Um, you know, you, you, you can't hurt me. And I'm just going to say this. Start warranting all your root canals and crowns five years. 
and you tell your patients, uh, oh, this tooth come off the front tooth, snapped off the gun line. I'm going to do a root canal, post buildup, and a crown. Oh, yeah, you're a hero, doc. Warranty it for five years. Because when they walk back in in three years and you got to redo it for free, you start changing your whole diagnosing and treatment planning. And then you start thinking, yeah, maybe I should have pulled that tooth out and done an implant. Warranty every root canal five years and you'll start placing more implants. The patients themselves are demanding it. They themselves see that they spent money on it and they're demanding. The, the, the demand is there. The demand is maybe not all the financial wherewithal is there, but that's changing because the cost of doing this is dropping. As you see, there are companies like ourselves who don't need to maintain a sales force, are able to provide US-made implants at the highest level of quality. And, with uh, digital help and all of a sudden your your the cost of doing care drops and more patients are able to afford it like LASIK and and, and weigh in on all on four none on three I mean do you think you should have an entire treatment plan based where if okay. one implant fails you're gonna uh, have to take it out you, okay so I'm gonna I'm gonna weigh in on both sides okay because I used to I, I would tell my patients I, I had a case fee I didn't have a fee per, per implant. I had a case fee. I said to them, just like a person's going to build your kitchen, they're not going to count how many nails are going in. i got to build you a mouth, and I'm not going to count how many implants I'm putting in. I don't care. The patients go, wow, how is that? Because it would cost me an extra $100, $200 to put an implant. What do I care? But the, what, where it becomes a problem is in that when you, the more implants you place in an arch, the more difficult it is to parallel those implants and get them that restoration parallel. That's part of the reason behind the all on four. If you have enough bone, if you have enough bone, you can do an all on four and they'll work quite well if you're careful with it and so on and so forth. And it'll be a much easier restoration because you're only trying to parallel four. You grew up in restorative dentistry. I practiced restorative dentistry for a while. If you had to tell me that I had to do a full arch restoration, crown and bridge, and there are no pontics, and I had to prep 15, 14 teeth to get that restoration in there. How long did it take you to prep such a case? Well, the answer is a couple of days or all day. I, I roughed it in one day. I sweated like crazy to get the temps and I broke the case up even though I didn't want to. And that's what periodontal prosthesis was. I was trained at Penn. That's what periodontal prosthesis, these were, these were all, these guys were, were geniuses. They could prepare periodontally involved teeth and get them all parallel and get them splinted. That's hard. The more implants you have, the harder it is. And so I think that's one pressure. The other pressure is, well, I don't have to do all on four. I can do all on five. I can put a couple extra in the back. But So yes, it doesn't have to be all on four, but there is a lot of all on four. I don't think it necessarily is because of, um, of well, maybe it is. They're using maybe more expensive implants or something. I really don't know. But I think part of it is because they got to get the case in. And we're, 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 we're in overtime. I'm, I'm two minutes over, so I got to wrap this up. But just um, a, lot of the, a lot of these guys are asking, though, do, do you always have to connect it with a bar? Um, what, what about locators and, and balls and locators? Are, are, are you a fan of balls and locators, or do you always prefer a, a bar? Of, I'm, a fan, I'm a fan of a blue sky, a biosnap. And the reason why I'm a fan of biosnap is because we're, we're, you know, we do a lot of R&D. That's what we do. We just don't clone. So I don't know if you know this yet, but you had a blog on your on Dental Town. I know you don't read the blog Dental Town as much as you should. And one of them is... I'm on there all day, every day. So you didn't see the thing about the vodka? I caught you. The vodka. I said I was giving a pre-bottle of vodka for somebody who could figure out how many cycles the new polymer we have that works on our BioSnap would last. Because again, we're an R&D company. So we came, we used the same plastics that are used in heart valves and in heart, heart rebuilds, which can't fail, and also in military applications that are also biocompatible. We tried to wear them out. So we got to, I think, a million cycles, and we couldn't wear it out. Wow. Same, the same resistance. So I, I'm not going to use the word locator, because I think we have a, don't you, you know, we have just, a, I think that, that polymer is a game changer. So and, it, and, what, and what's this called? Biosnap. But, but then you don't have to have a bar, so you save $1,000 on the lab bill. But, but I mean, what, what are the pros and cons of a, ball, of a bar versus balls okay. and locators? Okay, so the difference between a bar and, a, and, an, in, and a, a, an individual implants is that a, a, a snap-retained implant, an implant case or denture case, when the patient bites down, the implants cannot be what is supporting the load. It has to be the tissue underneath it. Because what will happen is that the pressure of the denture lingual will create a force 
on each of the implants and eventually push them out. That's much more of a problem in the maxilla. In the mandible, you don't need a bar at all. In the maxilla, because the bone is more flexible and, and it will tend to bend down towards the buckle, the implants tend to lose bone on the lingual, interestingly enough, because of the pressure on the, on the denture case. That's why, pe that's why probably more people do a bar on the upper. On the lower, that's not the case because the vertical axis of load is generally directly over the implant, so they can do it. The reason why people do a bar on the lower is because sometimes the tissue is so thin and it's painful. They, they've lost a lot of the bone almost up to the nerve. They need to have something to take off the load. And individual implants cannot take off the load in an unsplinted fashion on a denture long term on the upper, I believe. I don't, but I know a lot of people who do it, and a lot of people do it successfully. For example, that's why there's two of us. And two of us, we don't necessarily think the same. There's Albert Sickman and myself. Albert has had hundreds and hundreds of implants on the upper, supporting a upper denture, no problem. Me, ah, it drove me crazy. You're an amazing person. I can't believe it's already been an hour and five minutes. I could talk to you all day, every night. You're a great guy. Um, you. You're, right. you're so amazing on the boards. Uh, you're sharing uh, never stops um, I have a lot of friends who know you from dental town everyone thinks you're just one hell of a guy I think you're a hell of a guy thank you for all that you do for dentistry thank you so much for all that you do for dental town and thank you so much for giving me an hour of your time today no problem anytime Howard thank you for what you do for dentistry it's really amazing all right I'll see you on the boards thank you bye-bye now